to another episode of Milk Your Brand today with the awesome Graham Quinn, manager of employer branding at Zalando, the Europe's leading online platform for fashion and lifestyle. Hey Graham, thank you so much for accepting the challenge and to be here. So today's subject will be why the employee experience is important and I'm pretty sure you will have unique insights. And starting with the first question, we, we often hear that the candidate experience sets the foundation for the overall employee experience. And considering your experience so far, could you share some insights or strategies and practices that help you to create a memorable candidate experience? Sure, yeah. Uh, first off, well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, but yeah, to go back to your question, you know, I think it's, I think, you know, your first tangible experience with the employer brand um, is really with the can experience. You know, it's the easiest way to get a sneak peek into the culture and how they treat their employees. Um, it's really to see how, you know, can, yeah, like how a company handles their can experience as well. Um, that's the greatest insight that candidates have. Um, so I think this question can still exist as its own <laughs> within an episode, as I think there are too many strategies or practices to list per se. Um, but I think there are like a few things that any company can do to help create a memorable experience. You know, if we're taking a look at the application process, um, is it hard to navigate? Like what's the ex user experience like to apply? If, you know, 90% of your users are viewing it on mobile and you can't upload your CV um, from your mobile device, then that's a friction point and that's gonna be detrimental to your application process. Um, but at the same time too, if you're on a desktop, are you uploading your CV and it's still asking you to fill out all this information about you know, your experience, your background? Do you have to create a login to apply? Um, so I think overall for this one, it's just better yet to put yourself in the can shoes and go through it yourself. Um, and then if we're, you know, if we're talking about the interview processes, are you providing enough information to help your candidates feel well-informed and knowledgeable about the roles, the company or the culture? Um, so I think another easy way to deal, deal with this is Share a candidate info starter pack that lists all the information they need, you know, whether um, it's about questions that are gonna arise about the culture or the history. It's all about providing them with the most and best experience they have. Um, and, you know, connected to DEI as well. If you wanna, you have to keep your interview, keep your interviewers all on the same page by asking them, having them all ask the same questions um, and sharing that list with candidates ahead of time so that there is no deviation between the questions, but at the same time too, candidates are well aware of the questions ahead of time to help them prepare. You know, it's not about cheating if that's how they can get the best, their best experience across. Um, so that's really what an interview is, is about um, sharing your experiences and backgrounds. Um, and to that point as well, you know, how long is your interview process? Are we talking six stages or two? Um, because there's going to be a huge drop-off rate if you know you're going through eight, nine interview stages compared to two interview stages. Um, so overall, just keep your stages short and respect the candidate for the time they invest into it. Um, and I think my last point really is just to be human. Um, other people do great interviews while others struggle with it. So I think it's easy to judge a person based off of your first impression. But again, you can be great at interviews and a terrible hire and vice versa. Um, so it, it's it's all subjective, but you know, treat everyone's respects and see the interview process as a two way street. Um, leave enough time for candidates to see if this is the right fit for them, and lastly, give candidates the option to hear from you via phone call or email um, with actual feedback from their interview process. You know, we can't help them improve in the future, or we're not helping them set up set them up for success if we don't know if they don't know what to improve on. Um, so I think to kind of like wrap it all up, you know, if we, we often forget it in employee experience, employee branding and talent acquisition, that a lot of companies are missing the human elements and forgetting to see that's not a us versus them mentality. Um, and they should be grateful we're interviewing them. Mm -hmm. This sense of ego will really only hurt companies in the long run. And I think as humans, we're better than that. So, you know, we don't know what's going on or why we don't know what's happening in the lives of our candidates and why they're interested in joining us, but we need to treat them better. Um, and I think when it boils down to it, I think it's an industry that 
um, we need to work on throughout the can experience to make it more memorable for our candidates. You know, capacity is an issue for TAPS, sure, but if we take these small micro steps towards creating a better experience in, you know, in one year and two years, we'll have drastically improved the can experience and how can't feel when they interview with us. Good. You actually talked about user experience um, for candidates and especially the, the first journey of the, the employee experience. Um, do you have any examples uh, during the, the whole process um, as an employee, official employee? Um, yeah, I guess, sorry, can you clarify that question? Of course, um, because you already mentioned that we need to be more transparent and, of course, uh, care about the user experience when we care about the, the, the employee as a candidate. But I also want to know more about, um, as an employee of the company, because you mentioned a lot about the candidate experience, and I want to know more about the employee experience as well. Yeah, so I think... Um... I think a great example of how we can improve the employee experience as well is, you know, when we talk about how to find information, um, especially in large, complex organizations, we often think, you know, with tenured employees, we're often thinking with using internal jargon and language. Um, and, you know, I've worked at some companies before where they've had acronym dictionaries because um, that's just how massive and complex the organization is. And so I think we need to take away this step of using internal language and jargon to communicate clearly to both you know candidates and employees alike um, because you have to think of everything in layman's terms put everything in layman's terms or how can we make this information as easy easily digestible as possible um because if, if you think about someone who's joining a new company you're overwhelmed from the very first day um, there's a lot of information being thrown at you but ticking into what i just mentioned all this information is coming to you from someone who's been tenured within a company using internal jargon. So it often crosses a barrier where it's just too confusing for employees and new employees alike. Um, so I think that's, I, I think it's one of the easiest ways to fix things but at the same time to kind of going back to basics. I think it's just about like following through with your company values. And, you know, if we're talking about transparency, how are you transparent throughout the employee experience? So do you highlight what your career development opportunities are? Do you highlight the salaries and, you know, whether it's job ads or internally, like it's, it's, I think there are a lot of different opportunities and, but it also depends on, you know, like what does it come down to at the end of the day for your business and your culture? Um, and what areas are you doing well in and what areas can improve in? But I think you kind of just need to like go back to basics and take a step back and be like, are we, if we're looking for to communicate, A, are people receiving this in the language they're aware of? Um, you know, maybe it's like volunteering programs. Maybe there's a low uptake in volunteering initiatives. Is it how it's communicated? Is it how it's positioned? Is it how it's marketed? So I think it's, there's a lot of different opportunities depending on what the company is looking for. That's a perfect example. And still on the employee side, uh, with the rise of hybrid, remotes and in-person work models, what factors should organizations consider when deciding which approach to adopt for maximizing the employee experience? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question. Um, <laughs> I think there, I think there are a few factors that people need to first or businesses first need to consider. Um, I think the first one, and maybe the biggest one is, are we meeting the needs of our employees, including those with accessibility needs or health needs. Uh, maybe you have a disability or maybe you have a medical condition where, you know, having, being home is more appropriate for your health conditions than um, being in an office environment. You know, what about parents or caregivers? Um, I think a lot of these companies focus too much on able-bodied individuals without health or caregiving or accessibility needs. Um, and having hybrid or remote offers opportunities it helps these individuals with the flexibility to be their best self and care for others while still remaining productive um, to the company's bottom line. Um, like we all have lives outside of work and everyone is dealing with something, but we need to be flexible to accommodate 
a wide range of people rather than just um, you know able-bodied people who don't come from a minority or you know, you know maybe it's accessibility needs or health needs or I think we need to have an equitable approach to it. Um, and I think on the second point, I think the biggest one as well right now is cost of living. I think right now, if we look at major metropolitan cities across the world, you know, obviously where a lot of companies base their offices and headquarters, a lot of these cities right now are in the midst of a housing crisis and talent has moved elsewhere to either secure housing or to secure cheaper housing. Um, and having them come in every day into the office, you know, was the norm. But we're going back to a time that existed before COVID and where housing wasn't, it, it wasn't affordable, but it was attainable, whether you were renting or buying. Um, so I think we have to consider the cost of living because if we're not keeping salaries up to pace with inflation, then how are these employees dealing with the stresses of finances? Um, and obviously that stress of finance or other areas tries into their experience within the company and how productive they are. And I think that goes, I think it's a great segue into my next point, you know, productivity levels. Everyone has their own unique way of working and one size doesn't really fit all. Like I myself am more productive when I'm working from home where I'm not constantly distracted. And while others may find the complete opposite, you know, they might better focus in an office environment. Um, so really having that mixed approach, I think, again, is the best approach because, you know, if you have three different employees who have a hybrid remote or fully in office, they're all going to be productive on different levels, but they know themselves best. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's culture. Like, a lot of these companies are reinventing what their office space means to them. You know, it often feels like it's geared towards one approach or another. You know, it's it's either like all office tasks or like spaces to collaborate. And I guess this is my own view. And the issue I find with this is with like that or hot desking, you don't feel any more connected to the culture. Um, you know, if you don't have a desk, like it's not a tangible. Thing you can sit at and you know it's yours you're just it's it's like a we work essentially um and i think that like psychological shift happens you know when you don't have your own desk and our business businesses make a hot desking area within the office you know it's not to say there isn't a reason for having hot desks but don't segregate those desks away from everyone else because while the intention is to have remote or hybrid workers come to the office every now and then Secluding them off to one area on the floor will only make them feel more disconnected from the culture. Um, yeah, so I think when it comes down to it, like not one model or approach is really going to work for everyone. There will always be someone who isn't happy, but at the end of the day, like we need to make sure that our work environments are equitable and inclusive. You know, if we're talking about barriers to the office, there might be less barriers at home than the office. Um, but yeah, when it comes to it, it comes down to it, like we focus on implementing flexible working hours and a flexible approach to the work environments. I really believe employees and candidates, you know, are better off and productivity will increase, you know, whether it's virtual interviews or in-person interviews. I really like your perspective on it. And once again, you focus on being more empathetic and that really amazed me. Thank you for your opinion on that. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think companies really need to like put that focus back on being empathetic and human with their employees. Super base. important. Yeah. And well, I have a different challenge for you. Uh, I did not mention it to you, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a question this time. It's actually more of a game. It's one of our segments and it's called love or spill the milk basically i will say something and you need to say uh if you love it or not and in this case uh if you not love it you need to spill the milk if you know what i mean <laughs> okay i like i like the premise of the game i'm done <laughs> so first one the goal of employee branding is to generate the biggest amount of applications spill the milk <laughs> okay. Uh, can you explain me why did you choose spill the milk? I think, I mean, this was a very quick answer for me because I think a lot of companies focus more on 
the traction standpoint. So they see employer branding really as a tool within the toolkit. So it's like the hammer within a set of tools because, and for bad representation too, I just don't think, I think a lot of companies think they know employer branding, but don't really see the value it has across the whole employee journey from attraction to off, uh, offboarding or slash alumni. Um, so because there's this lack of understanding, um, a lot of companies see it as just a way to market new jobs. And it often comes after, you know, there's the rules open for two, three months and they're not getting applications. Then it's this way for them just to, it's kind of like a reactive approach rather than, um, like an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as an industry, that's where a lot of practitioners really struggle is with these companies who just see it as an attraction driver versus a way to help tell the story of an employer and position that within the market. So obviously you have, I'll, I'll keep this short, but like if you have, if you're using employer branding to hire a role or to fill a role, what's better to have 1500 applicants or with low quality, 1500 low quality applicants or 30 applicants that are high quality. You know, it's, if we're going back to business needs and time acquisitions time to review the applicants, I'd rather have like 30, I'd rather go through 30 CVs and they all be high quality than 1500 poor quality applicants. Cause I'm, I'm just spending my time going through this. So I think it's about, repelling the many and really attracting the few. Good. I'm going to be honest. I I was pretty sure that you were going to say spill the milk because you talked about it uh, in one of your posts. And actually, you talked about the misbeliefs uh, that exist about employer branding. So I was very curious. What were you going to say uh, about this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've before like I, I've been, I've been on all sides of employer branding. I've been in the marketing side. I've been in a full on employer brand side and I've actually been a recruiter as well. And to be honest, I'd rather not waste my time. I mean, not that I'm wasting my time, but I'd rather, of course, I'd rather go through 30 out, like 30 CVs that are all high quality and pass that on to the hiring manager than it is to the rest of the business, because I could spend the rest of the time that are suited for, you know, employer branding activities or, um, whatnot or better to like, better delivering can experience for my employee or my candidates than, you know, like if you have 30 high quality mm -hmm. interactions with candidates, I think that speaks volumes compared to 1500 poor interactions, you know? So, but again, I'm all about personalization and being human centric. So. Totally agree. It's the way you invest your time. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Second and last one of the game. Merchandising plays a big role in employees' engagement. Ooh. <laughs> Can I, oh. I would, I think I would say love, but spill the milk if possible. Okay, I'm interested. Uh, yeah, I think. I think it comes down to the company because I think it comes down to the company and, and the person like the individual themselves, because I'd rather I'm all about minimalism. I'd rather not have cheap, low quality stuff that's completely branded with company merch um, to feel engaged. Like that's not engagement to me. Engagement to me personally is, is my salary healthy for the role that I'm, working in, do I have growth opportunities? Are there opportunities for me to like develop myself with the learning and development budgets? Um, however, I think certain other employees do get excited about company merch or company swag. Um, but I think the reason why I'm half is, is, is it's because it's all, it's a value based system really of, you know, if you believe in sustainability, you're not going to want to take, cheap swag that you may never use again after you leave the company um yeah where others are just like gung-ho about showcasing their patagonia vests or jackets you know their salesforce bags their ibm bags on the street um 
So I think at the end of the day, I think you just have to understand what's best for your employees and what aligns with your culture. Um, but I know it is a very growing problem within our industry. Yeah, but I, I think that the merchandising needs to reflect on the culture of the company. So I think you have a point on there. Yeah, and like if you're, and like I fully agree with that. Like if you're an environmental company, if you're, I don't know, say you're an energy, a green energy company. Mm -hmm. um, again, like what are we talking about merch? Are we talking like tangible stuff or maybe merch is like, you know, because we're a green energy company, let's donate to tree on your behalf. Like I'd rather have the company donate a tree or like actually contribute to something sustainable. Like maybe they match my donation to a charity that supports the UN sustainable development goals, you know? Um, but if it's like t-shirts and bags, mm -hmm. I'll skip out. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Good to know your opinion on it. Okay, let's continue with the questions. <laughs> Employee experience measurement is vital for understanding and improving the workplace. What methods or metrics do you use to measure the employee experience effectively? I, I feel like this is a trick question. <laughs> um, can any like one individual give like three to five metrics that would help measure performance? Because I mean, I I think there are a few, but I well, I want to caveat this by saying or asking like what you're trying to like what company you're trying to understand from the data and how they'll use it effectively. Um, okay. And like obviously you you don't want to give like ten different metrics because if you have ten different metrics, it's going to be you're just watering down the data effectively. Um, or you'll have you'll be left with data paralysis. So I think going back to it to get a complete picture of your performance and efforts, um, you have to take a look at both qualitative and quantitative data. So from a quantitative viewpoint, let's look at retention and attrition rates. You know, average tenure, absence rate, you know, social engagement, you know, hours spent volunteering or hours spent on the learning development platform and other courses taken. Um, and then with regards to qualitative data let's review employee pulse survey data, you know, exit reasons. Um, and if your company practices stay interviews, then the data from this as well. Um, so I think you need to have both data points or both sets of data coming together and then kind of choosing three to five metrics based off that to help you kind of complete a holistic picture. Um, but again, it depends on like what you're trying to measure okay. for and what outcomes you're trying to base yourself against um for example you, we we already discussed about culture is is there any way to measure if your strategy is working in terms of culture of the company uh i would like right off the bat i would say engagement um how okay. engaged so i think two questions i i mean depending you can merge these two together to come up with your engagement score but you know, do you, you can ask your employees in a pulse survey, would you recommend this place? Would you recommend ABC company to any of your friends? And then how do or do you see yourself staying within the company within the next year, two years? Um, and so I think those two questions, if you base them together, that could be your engagement score. And that can help you tell whether people are buying into the culture per se. Okay. And still about the culture, when it comes to enhancing the, the employee's experience, what is your perspective on perks like ping pong tables or Friday drinks or games nights? Are they really crucial elements or do you believe we need to focus on more fundamental, fundamental aspects? <laughs> I mean, I'm probably one of the fast, hard-lined critics on this. Um, I just don't believe talent ever wanted these perks. They were always a way for tech startups to compete against each other and or talent, attract, talent attraction drivers. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, whether it was like Friday drinks or free breakfast or dinner, like to, like you see at fan companies, you know, Facebook, Microsoft, LinkedIn, 
the end of the day, you're spending more time at work when it boils down to it. And that's a bonus for the company. Um, but if we look at Gen Z specifically, you know, data has shown that they're more values driven and care about sustainability, DEI, and mental health. So are they going to be drawn to ping pong tables and making a big generalization? But well, probably no. But I think the issue here is that as an industry and companies, we need to stop pigeonholing ourselves to be focusing on only one target audience or demographic when it comes to talent. So instead of focusing on what millennials want in the workplace or what Gen Z's want in the uh, workplace, we're excluding other generations that exist in the workplace. You know, we got baby boomers, et cetera. Um, so not every benefit or perk is going to attract everyone. Um, so connect it back to your EVP. What do you want to be known for? If you're an online learning platform, maybe you'll offer, you know, a $3,000 learning development budget. Uh, if you're an alcoholic beverage company, maybe offer a significant discount on company products, but you're going to have two different talent segments attached to, attached to each of these. Um, so you're going to be excluding, you know, if you're talking about alcoholic discount or products on alcoholic discounts or discounts on alcoholic products, sorry, how many people don't drink that are going to want to work for your company, you know? Um, so I think in the end, it's important to listen to what your employee base wants, understand what will help you make yourself unique as a place to work and connect it back to your culture. And then, you know, maybe ping pong or maybe ping pong tables and, you know, maybe that is ping pong tables. Like maybe like you have this very like bro startup culture, which probably will exclude a lot of different genders. Mm -hmm. um, but you just need to evaluate what's going on on an ongoing basis and what your offering is. So I think, you know, when it comes to these perks, maybe like evaluate once a year, every 16 months, so 18 months. Um, just really understand like what your talent segment wants and position yourself accordingly. Okay, so focusing on your goal, your employee value proposition, and also your target because your target could be very different and you need to think as a whole right yeah i mean like if you're in a remote company you're like a maybe you sell uh hr software that focuses on distributed workforces and your whole team is 100 fully remote you know like that's your employee experience but that's also a unique perk and people who don't do well in play remote role like that's not going to attract them so I think you have to tie it back to again like what you want to be known for um because like if yeah if I'm interested in ping pong tables maybe I'll go work at Facebook you know um but yeah I think you just need to understand like what kind of audience talent segments and personas you want to attract and then go that route and see how you can what that looks like for you okay and Focusing on the topic of the audience and employee, how do you ensure that your employer branding message accurately reflect the reality of the employee experience? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question, um, but I think this is also a great example on why employer branding and whoever is responsible for employee experience, whether it's an employer brand practitioner or someone within people in an organization or people in culture, really need to collaborate and work together. You know, unless you're fortunate enough to have someone with employer brand experience in an employee experience role. Um, but going back to your question, I think, you know, you have to ensure you're incorporating and weaving your EVP. So your pillars, your key EVP messaging and culture values into each stage of the employee journey to really help create moments that matter. So I think a great way to think about this approach is Kind of going back to what we were saying earlier, create a graphical representation of your employee journey, but apply that design thinking or user experience mindsets to identify how your employees move throughout the organization. Um, and you know, once you have everything mapped out, utilize all that current available data. So whether it's qualitative or quantitative to understand the strengths, the developments and the key focus areas. And now you have, you'll have this mini roadmap to really see where you can integrate parts of your EV pillars and culture into your employee experience. Um, but at the end of the day, like as we know it within our industries, 
anything relating to employee brands and employee experience, you really need a team to help support you and stand behind you. So everyone from the executive team with their buy-in and active participation to IT and tech teams, you know, HR, your biggest supporters, p and PNC, and probably your biggest supporters are your employee base. Um, so our work can't solely exist within a vacuum and it won't have the success needed without all these different gears coming together to move the needle. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's just about having this collaborative approach and going at it together versus alone as an employer parent practitioner. This is a good point. Um, because I was asking if the, um, if the company is actually going through a rough time, how could you pass this message and still does not affect the way people perceive your image? You know, but yeah. I think the collaboration here is also an important topic. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it's like going to that point. You know, it's. I think this is the thing: is if you're large enough to have an internal comms team, um, there's often that disconnect, right, between internal comms telling execs to say one thing, but not having that employer brand insight. So not having employer brand insight into the challenges the companies are facing can be detrimental because as much as you want to communicate one thing, it may turn on your back and then employees don't feel supported or whatnot. Um, where, you know, if you're using the right tone, the right method of delivery, it really has a huge impact. And at the end of the day, like everyone, you know, it's word of mouth. You tell your friends about your experience. So I don't know. Okay. If I don't know if you remember the Airbnb experience, but prior at the start of the pandemic, when they had to lay off a huge amount of their workforce, they did it with such care and grace that like that was it like, you know, for three years later, that still sticks in one of my it still sticks in my mind as like one of the best employer brand moments that really mattered as how to handle layoffs respectfully. Um, could yeah, you I mean, please, sorry, could you please elaborate on, on that topic of Airbnb? Because I don't know if the listeners uh, know wh what happened. And if you know something about it, it could be really great to, to know what you're talking about. Yeah, um, so I'm probably missing a few points here. But when they realized that a large amount of their user base wasn't going to be traveling anymore, they had to uh, lay off a huge significant amount of their workforce. Um, and what that meant for the company was, I can't remember exactly how they communicated, um, but there was so much thought in the message behind Brian's statements of how it wasn't just like, we're all in this together, but the exec team was fine. It was very human centric language um, and it really focused okay. on the employees. To that being said, they were able to keep all their company devices. They were given really great uh, exit packages in terms like health benefits, um, learning and developments. Like there was so much outplacing support and departing benefits that I've never heard any bad employee say anything or any employee say anything bad about how it was handled. Um, it like the layoff situation was just handled with such delicacy delicacy and grace that it really spoke volumes to how you know the employer brand eth or the airbnb ethos you know because we're talking about people going to strangers homes and how can we make it a safe and comfortable environment where they people feel like they can be themselves and i think that translated perfectly into how they you know layoffs are unfortunate situation but they delivered it with such grace that um it really worked out in their favor and if we look, you know, two years into the future, when they announced that employees can work anywhere in the world, their job site page shot up a huge amount in viewings. Because um, again, it goes back to how they deal with the layoffs, but at the same time to how they recognize that people want to be able to work for anywhere or from anywhere. So it's I keep referencing it, but I think Airbnb is a great example of how to deal with employer brands and how it connects to your ethos.
Thank you for sharing. I think, uh, like you said, it needs to be focused on empathy. Companies need to be more empathic and always thinking about the employees and the person because after all, you're a person and you need to deal with one, you know? Yeah, and I mean, like, even if you're on the exec team, you're gonna have a completely different experience than say the front desk staff or an intern. So I think being able to empathize with them and realize that like, you know, maybe you are privileged, like that speaks volumes as well. And if we go back to Apple, I think this was about a year ago, Tim Cook cut his salary, uh, I forget how by how much to reduce the amount of layoffs that had to happen for cost saving measures. And I'm probably again, like, that's something, you know, take, take my word for it, like research it, but that also showed great respect and leadership and understanding like an exec stepping up to the plate and saying, I'm going to like sacrifice my salary by say 50% so that the business can thrive. So we don't have to lay off people. Okay. I didn't know that. And it's also a great example. Yeah, I highly recommend everyone research both. Thank you so much, Graham, uh, for being here, for sharing all that valuable knowledge that you have. And for those who are listening to us, please follow us on social media. Uh, if you want to know more about employer branding and you have a specific question, please let us know. You can always DM us. And that's all for today. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. Of course. Thank you, Graham. Mm -hmm.